Revelation is a timeless message from God to his people. Regardless of our perspective on the timings and fulfillments of John's visions, all Christians should agree that the book of Revelation is as relevant today as it was when John wrote it. Our circumstance may be different, but our God hasn't changed, and the values and perspectives John taught are still binding on us today. We can be encouraged by God's goodness in the past, present, and future. We can be confident in His love for us and His control over history. And we can respond to Him in faith, now and for the rest of our lives. The book of Revelation has fascinated both believers and unbelievers ever since it was written but different interpreters understand the symbols and imagery of the book in very different ways. The strange creatures, the cosmic battles, the plagues and judgments, some interpreters find these images so confusing that they lose all hope of understanding this part of scripture. But the truth is that much of this confusion stems from our unfamiliarity with the historical context of the book. So in order to learn how to interpret and apply Revelation rightly, it helps to understand something about its history. There's great value in being able to understand the setting of each of the biblical books. I wouldn't say it's uh, essential, mind you. Uh, God's word has an eternal function and, and uh, people can relate to it directly. And if you don't have to know the original setting, it doesn't stop it from being true. Having said that, uh, we're going to get far more out of the Bible if we understand the original setting which was written. And we can understand that it was written to people in this culture and this time with these particular issues. And when we see that, we can get a better handle on, well, how does that apply to us? Even though we're in a different situation, we can, as it were, uh, match over what the original message meant. And so a great deal of effort is given into trying to find the historical setting of the books. And uh, sometimes it come, doesn't come up with great answers, but sometimes we can get a very good understanding of what the original context was. And when we get that, we're in a much better position to apply from that context to our own. According to Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, John wrote the book of Revelation while he was on Patmos, a small island in the Aegean Sea, approximately 40 miles southwest of Ephesus. Patmos is a rocky and barren place, virtually devoid of trees. Its unpleasantness made it a good location to punish popular people who were perceived as threats to the civil order of the Roman Empire. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 strongly implies that John had been exiled to Patmos. While John was enduring these harsh conditions, he received several visions from Christ. And the book of Revelation is John's record of and commentary on these visions. John explicitly addressed Revelation to seven churches in Asia Minor, in an area that's now part of Western Turkey. The churches were located in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Each church received encouragement and when necessary rebukes according to its condition. Revelation, its central purpose, its central message is, number one, to inform the seven churches of their position in Christ. Just as he suffered and was victorious, so too they will suffer and will be victorious. Uh, it's a theme that permeates the entire book. Um, secondly, it is they need to put their faith and trust in God's sovereignty, Christ's so sovereignty, and the Spirit's sovereignty. Because Christ was put to death and rose again, he is now, he is now the conquering hero. He's the conquering lion. He is victorious and he has conquered the evil one. So he is sovereign. God, Christ, and the Spirit are all sovereign. And they can now rest in um, God's sovereignty in the midst of trials, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of false teaching. They need to rely on Him because they are undergoing severe persecution, severe trials, severe testing. And it's very easy for them to commit idolatry, to become part of the world system. But instead, they need to rely on God's sovereign hand. During the time that John was writing the book of Revelation, 
the churches of Asia Minor were struggling with a perceived discrepancy in their beliefs. On the one hand, they believed that God ruled history and that Christ had been victorious over this present evil age. Jesus had fulfilled Old Testament hopes by coming as the deliverer for all who believed in him. But on the other hand, the churches of Asia Minor had to deal with the reality that evil was still very much at work in their world. As a result, they faced some very difficult questions like, if salvation has come in Christ, why does the world still tempt Christians to sin? If Christ reigns, why doesn't he rescue us from our persecution? And of course, how and when will all of these trials end? In one way or another, these questions all relate to eschatology, and they are precisely the kind of questions that the book of Revelation answers. John was clearly aware of the theological tensions created by the New Testament's outlook on the last days. And one of his goals for the book of Revelation was to help Christians cope with it. Throughout his book, he encouraged his readers to view this tension in light of two victories. First, he called their attention to the victory that Jesus had already won over the present age. Through his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ had secured every true believer's inward spiritual salvation. This initial victory is celebrated in places like Revelation chapter 1 verse 18, where Christ proclaimed that he had risen from the dead and would never die again, as well as in chapters 5 and 12, which speak repeatedly about the authority and power Christ received through his death and resurrection. The second victory John highlighted was the final victory Christ will achieve when he returns a victory that will result in the complete destruction of God's enemies and the renewal of all creation. This final victory is in view in places like Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 and throughout chapters 19 and 22. John wanted his original audience to know that Jesus Christ really had defeated the power of sin, suffering, and death, just as the Old Testament had foretold. And on this basis, John also encouraged his readers to trust that Jesus would return to complete God's judgment and salvation. We have to think about how the unexpected delay of God's kingdom, uh, how it affected the, the outlook of uh, the original audience, the original readers of the book of Revelation. Uh, Christ had uh, ascended, uh, the gospels testify to that, the apostles were testifying to that, and. And there are things uh, in the Gospels that, and even in the Apostle Paul that might be understood as saying that Christ would come again soon. And so uh, as those first century Christians were uh, openly professing Christ as Lord and beginning to experience persecution, uh, hardship, uh, even just the normal uh, difficulties of regular economic upheaval and displacement, uh, they could have wondered had uh, the promise of Jesus to return again had it failed. This is how they were to respond to the situation. They were to stand firm in their faith, knowing that Christ had overcome, that Christ had won the victory, and that God was sovereignly ruling the universe from that great throne scene in Revelation chapters four and five, that God was ruling on the throne and there was nothing happening outside, not only of his his ability to control, but his, his, his willingness and his permission and his active will to control things. Because it would be by the suffering of those first century Christians and by their persevering in faith that, that people would be drawn to Christ the victor by witnessing that persevering faith. I think Revelations 2 and 3 are absolutely key to the letter of the book of Revelation because they give us, in many ways, the application points for the church and the characteristics that the churches are asked to manifest. And one especial one is found in the refrain at the end of each of the messages to the church, which is to overcome. To, eat, to the church who overcomes, to those who overcome, it says. And, and that reminds us of the need to persevere. But there's other overarching themes as well. So, so one of the words that you'll encounter as you're reading through those two chapters a number of times is to repent. For those churches who are falling short of what the Lord is calling them to, they, they are to repent. Should it be that they've lost their first love? Should it be that they've um, been 
following the teachings of a, a, a sectarian group or a, really a, a heretical group within the church, they're called to repent from that as well. And so the Lord is calling them back to himself in that moment. Uh, but he's also calling those who do love him to continue and those who are persevering to continue in that as well and, and to stay true to the faith, but to stay true especially to the worship of the Lord. The similarities between the letters in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 alert us to the main ideas in this section. Christ was addressing these churches as their rightful king. He was aware of their present circumstances and had the authority to evaluate them. He offered blessings and he threatened curses to encourage their faithfulness. And he reminded them that eternal salvation was only for those who overcame trials and temptations. Not surprisingly, these themes also play a major role throughout the main body of the book of Revelation. We'll look briefly at the letter to Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In this letter, John introduced Jesus as the one who holds seven stars in his right hand as he walks among the seven golden lampstands. This description emphasized the light of Christ's glory and power. As their king, Jesus gave a mixed evaluation of the church in Ephesus. They had commendable zeal for sound doctrine, and they didn't tolerate wicked behavior. They were specifically said to have hated the practices of the Nicolaitans a very early heretical group that may have mixed Christian faith with pagan eroticism. But the Ephesian church also received a strong criticism. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus told them that they had forsaken their first love. They had lost their enthusiasm and zeal for Christ and His kingdom. So Christ warned them that if they didn't repent and return to their earlier enthusiasm, He would remove their lampstand, their symbol of honor in heaven. In other words, they would be disciplined and perhaps even disbanded. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God cursed them and banished them from the garden, especially so that they wouldn't eat from the tree of life and live forever. But when Christ returns, the river of life will water the tree of life again and all the nations will have access to its fruit. All of redeemed humanity will be healed. There won't be any more sin, sickness, or disease. Natural disasters will never occur again. All nations will govern themselves in righteousness and peace. And all of God's creation will fully display His glory.